For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomalekai. Joining me today is award-winning author and publisher, Melinda Ferguson, here to unpack her book titled, When Love Kills. In your book, you recount the tragic tale of Anele Tembe and Kanan Forbes, the hip-hop star known as AKA. So can you tell us about these two individuals and their relationship, how it turned toxic? Sure. You know, my book has been out uh, for a while now. I haven't done interviews for a couple of weeks and I had to kind of pick my book up and go, yeah, I remember you wrote this because it caused so much trouble and it caused so much outcry. And, you know, that's a very broad question you're asking me. I mean, I think we all know who AKA was, you know, probably well self-proclaimed as the best and the biggest hip-hop star that South Africa has ever seen, had ever seen. And, of course, his girlfriend, uh, fiancé, his late fiancé now, and both of them are sadly no longer with us, uh, Anele Tembe. And I think that their relationship really captured the social media kind of obsession, watching this very beautiful young Zulu women and this very, I guess, charming, successful, out there, big mouth, impressive, talented hip-hop star, this relationship that seemed to go all the way. La Bola was paid. And the next thing, you know, the news came out in April 2021 that Anele Tembe had jumped in the end. That's what people, uh, the, the kind of story became settled as that Anele Tembe had committed suicide. And then... Of course, last year, uh, Kiernan Forbes was tragically shot in Durban in February last year. And so I think that the story had such tragic repercussions in a way in this country that we were all torn apart for many different reasons why two young people who had the world at their feet were now both dead. And I guess that my book tries to uncover who... Kenan Forbes was, who Anele Tembe was, what their relationship was, and how they both landed up being tragically dead at a very young age. And how did you approach researching this book? Um, so who did you speak to and were you able to source reliable information? Well, you know, I'm a proper journalist. I wouldn't have done this book if I hadn't done that. And I think that's one of the things that people were kind of, trying to accuse me of, of, of like kind of making up stuff, not getting the right permission. There was a lot of criticism leveled at me, I think mainly because I was white. Well, I am white. I wasn't, wasn't white. I am white. And I think that was problematic for some people. Um, you know, I have a long history of working um, in popular culture, I worked at True Love magazine, uh, the biggest black women's magazine at the time, uh, for 11 years. I rubbed shoulders with a lot of the characters in the book. I did covers with Bonang Matebe, a.k.a. was on our cover when he won the Samas. Zintle was involved in our magazine on quite a big level because these were popular people. And in the beginning, when I first started talking about the book, I was quite reluctant to really speak about this part but I did work with Lynn Forbes for a significant amount of time she approached me to ghostwrite her book I can't really go into much detail on what that book was going to be about but uh, the two of us became very close ultimately we had to cancel that book with Lynn because she didn't want to have the book that we had originally signed up for and so we couldn't publish that book and so we cancelled that agreement with Lynn. I got to the point where Lynn didn't want to engage, but Moses Tembe and I met. I got a lot of information from him. And then I spoke to a number of people who wished to stay anonymous because so many people were afraid of talking in this story because either they were scared of being killed, either they were scared of being seen as disloyal to mainly AKA, so people who spoke to me about AKA, I think we're, we're very scared that they were going to be seen as being anti-AKA. And I think what happened with this book was that there were two sides. It's as though like you either were on Anele's side or you were on AKA's side. 
there were very few people who were looking at the story in an objective way. And I really tried to do that in the book. I find what happened with this book to be almost worthy of someone writing a master's thesis on how a book could be hated before it was even read. The idea of this book upset people. When Love Kills was a very probably controversial kind of title because most people don't like to believe that love has the potential to kill but all we have to do is look at something like Women for Change, the NGO that keeps on posting all the missing women, all the women that have been killed on a daily level. And we get to realize that in South Africa, the name love is often completely misconstrued and, and is attached to a lot of violence in this country. Um, Melinda, so do you think that authors should be required to get permission from the families in no. such circumstances? No. Not at all. You know, author or journalist. I was a journalist writing this book. I wasn't making the story up. Which journalist has ever phoned Lynn Forbes or Moses Tembe when they wanted to put a headline up about the relationship? You know, you just have to look at some of those reports when all those videos were coming out. Terrible accusations were being made against AKA, against Ken and Forbes. None of those journalists phoned Lynn Forbes or Tony Forbes and said, hey, can we write this about your child? So I think people don't really understand that a book is not that different to someone writing a news story, especially when it, it is in such a, the public realm of the story. It was a huge story. It was headlines. It was the most Googled story AKA's murder, Anele Tembe dying, all of these issues were huge and became as big as the Oscar Pistorius story on many levels. So did people phone Oscar's uncle every time they wrote a, a, a story? I wrote a book about Oscar. Did I phone his parents or did I ask him for permission? No. We are allowed to write things as journalists Every time someone writes a state capture book, do they phone Jacob Zuma and say, do you mind if I actually say this about you? No. So I could give you hundreds of examples. And I think the reason why was because they were no longer alive and because there's a sadness and there's heartbreak and it seems like it's almost bad manners. And I think maybe I underestimated how much that would upset people. But I still stand by the fact that I didn't need permission from either Moses or from Lynn or Tony to write this book. Moses, I never asked him for permission. I asked him, what, can I ask you about what happened with your daughter? Can I ask you what Anele Tembe was like when she was a little girl? I had already engaged a lot with Lynn. And there was a lot of stuff in the public realm all the interviews with AKA, he spoke a lot in public. He had many, many interviews. I mean, the Tembe Kile interview that I use a lot in the book, that's a very good source for me because that interview was asking Ken and Forbes what happened on the night or the morning that Anela Tembe lost her life. And also, Melinda, you quoted um, Moses Tembe saying, when you yourself become vengeful, you drop yourself to that person's level. So how did you mm. interpret the statement? I asked Moses, looking him straight in the eye, did you get AKA killed? I didn't walk into the interview saying that. It was after a couple of hours where I felt comfortable enough with him. And I said, many people believe that you 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 had the hit called on, on, on AKA and or you had something to do with it. And he those were the kinds of responses you made. You know, when you become vengeful, vengeful when you hate. I really don't believe that Moses Tembe called the hits on AKA. I actually got to feel that way after. And before I went to meet him, I did believe it. But saying that, I believe that it's connected. I don't think Ken and Forbes was killed for, for just some arbitrary reason. I do think there was a, a revenge killing that happened, but do I believe that Anela's father did it? I don't. But there are many people in the circle. There are many people who were outraged by what happened to Anela Tembe. You didn't have to be Moses to be upset by it. 
And more than two years after the death of Anele, an inquest was opened with a lot of evidence that was shared. So are you optimistic that it will finally oh. reveal the truth about the cause of Temba's death? You know, I was so optimistic initially. And I even wrote my book with the belief that my book would come out as the inquest was about to start. That was the date. We were given the dates. The inquest was supposed to start in April. I think mid-April. It was delayed and it's been delayed again. I messaged the Tembe's lawyer the other day to say, what is happening? Where is this thing? Why isn't it? And honestly, it doesn't feel like the Tembe's are delaying it. And you have to put, put two and two together there. But I believe that Moses and the Tembe family are desperate to have this inquest. Because as you know, in the book, I have listed a lot of compelling evidence that point to the idea that Anele Tembe did not jump. And when one looks at the evidence that will be heard one day, hopefully in the inquest, I do believe that we're going to hear that she did not kill herself and that something terrible happened in that room. I don't think AKA specifically intended to kill Anela Tembe. I don't think he was a murderer. I don't think he had these ideas and plans to kill his girlfriend. He wasn't that kind of guy at all. But I think that the two of them were so out of control. I think they were so inebriated. I think they were high. I think they were drunk. And I think that when people are in that state, an accident is, is able to happen where something terrible, where, where someone is either thrown or pushed or or slips in, in, in a violent fight, things go out of control. And I believe that's how she lost her life. It was in, in the middle of a fight, not her standing on the edge of the uh, paper club balcony. You know, in, in the book, it speaks about no fingerprints of hers are on the balustrade. And um, AKA phones reception to say needs help but the timing of the call is after she's already landed on the, on the street. There are many things in the book and in the evidence now that is supposed to be seen at the inquest that will point towards a lot of inconsistencies in Ken and Ford's story. And lastly, murder cases involving high-profile individuals often take years to be solved. So do you think the country's police and justice systems are doing enough to solve murder cases in the country? I think there's so many murder cases here. I mean, if you just have to look at how many people are killed every day, I just think it's shown us over and over again, even if you're famous, like Senzo, Miyewe, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be justice or there's going to be any kind of quick quick turnover of justice. So I th I'm sure it's really terrible to be a policeman in this country. I think it must be very hard to have that job. But there definitely are big loopholes and there are big flaws in our system that we can't, we don't see justice. And the fact that Anele Tembe, that, that, that there wasn't really a proper investigation into the, her death. There were many, many things that pointed towards the idea that she had not jumped, but it's only been because the Tembes had to relentlessly follow up, try and get the whole thing to be reopened and inquest to be, you know, and, and, and you think to yourself that the, the Tembes have money, they've got power, they've got some kind of sway. And if they can't even get justice for their daughter, imagine the, the person who's got no money, who's got nothing backing them, how are they ever going to get justice? That was Melinda Ferguson speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about when love kills.